even in the preparation, I suppose at the end of it, I feel I felt and feel like a cook in the kitchen. So you've got, um, if you can imagine, you've got a special occasion, you've invited loads of friends to come, and you want it to be good. You want to prepare lots of dishes for people to have selection and variety. And it feels that that's what we've got today. Um, the more I prepared, the more I saw, the more God revealed, the more there is. The more there was, the more there is. So hopefully, as you come to the table today, you will find something that you can eat, something that will edify you, something that will be tasty, something that will be good. Because I think there is so much. There is so much. In some ways, I could say that I am afraid that I would forget something or miss something, but I rebuke all fear. And I declare that I have the mind of Christ, so I will remember what he wants me to remember, and I will say what he wants me to say. So I pray that the Lord will be glorified, and I pray that you will be edified. We will all be edified. As you know that we are, we're currently, we're still in our Easter sermon series that covers the period from Palm Sunday right through to Pentecost. And in it, we're focusing on the journey of the early church. So we're giving particular attention to the um, experiences that, and the emotions that they were going through as each of the um, historic and significant events passed. And so far we have had six of the nine messages in the series. Last week, Malcolm, he spoke on the first part of John 21, as he's already said, and he explained and illustrated that God is in control. And I'm sure that everyone present was really appreciative of the illustrations that he gave, the drama, the visual aids, all of that. And there certainly were many laughs that came from his very fishy jokes. Um, If you missed it, if you like fishing, then um, I would encourage you to catch the message on the podcast, which you can find at www.onechurch.uk or via via YouTube. Now, Malcolm set the scene for me, and he's done it literally again today. So we have the fire. They were on the beach last week because Jesus met them for breakfast. They had fish. This week, some time has passed, so there is some fish as well. But they had gone fishing. So he set the scene. And today I'm looking at the second part of John 21 from uh, verses 15 to to 19. So it's just five verses. And in your Bibles, it's typically headed up as Peter's Restoration, In my Bible, it says Jesus restores Peter. But that explains why, as Malcolm said last week, he was limited in what he could share or say about Peter. Because this week, the message is all about Peter. Or so it seems. Now, the last time I stood here in this capacity, I shared a message on the perfect justice of God. And the parameters that were given for that message meant that I think it was probably a very theoretical or more of a theoretical message. But this message today, I think, is a practical demonstration of that, of the points that I shared, which essentially came down to, um, I think, from Romans 6, 8, um, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. God loves us, but we have choices And if we choose to do the wrong thing, then there are penalties. But if we choose to do the right thing, then there is reward. Now, as a prelude to that message, I shared a story um, about a Sunday school teacher who was um, trying to illustrate something from the um, story, perhaps, of Noah. And the teacher was um, showing pictures, and I tried to, I wanted to show you, um, give you an example of a picture that he was showing. Um, but something went wrong, and it went AWOL, basically. The picture went AWOL. It was absent without leave, so we couldn't see it. And I'm not going to go into the story, but um, those of you who were here last time can speak to those who weren't here last time, and they can explain everything that goes on. But as I said, um, the picture, it it went AWOL. It was absent without leave, but the good news is um, that all has been restored, and today we have the picture. Here is the picture. It was a picture of a squirrel. So those of you who remember what that story was about, as I said, you can find those who didn't and you can share it. Um, but all has, that which was lost has been found. All has been restored. Um, 
and return to its rightful place, as in the picture is here, and all has been forgiven. The title that I'm giving the message today is called Back to the Future, and it's in three parts. So first off, we're going to have a look at the scripture, which should be on the screen. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you that when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Amen. And before I delve into the actual restoration, I think it's important for us to understand um, how Peter got to the situation of needing to be restored. Because I think that will help us to better understand and appreciate what's actually going on um, at this moment. Um, So we're going to go back and look at the events that led up to it. And for those who don't know, Peter was the name that was given to Simon by Jesus when he first met him. And John 1.42 says, Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which when translated means Peter, a a stone or a rock. And that's from the translating from the Aramaic to the Greek to the English. Now, by trade, Simon Peter was a fisherman from Galilee, and he became um, not only one of Jesus' 12 disciples, but also one of his inner core of three, and he later became an apostle. Now, additionally, uh, Peter was, um, he was a leader, he, but he had been an uneducated man, and he was known for being rather impetuous. So basically, he liked to do things fairly quickly, but he didn't necessarily give it a lot of thought beforehand. So this first part of the message is called Peter Knows Best. And it's the night before Jesus died, which we now know to be Maundy Thursday, or we call Maundy Thursday. So the disciples are together. So setting the scene, the disciples are together in the upper room. It's kind of gone right back to John 13, but they're together in the upper room. And they've just finished the Passover meal, the Last Supper. And Jesus is steering the conversation And what we find through this conversation is that Peter makes a number of bold statements. So the disciples are perplexed because Jesus has also told them that one of them is going to betray him. Jesus also um, tells them that he's going to be going away, but that they can't follow him now. They can't come with him. And so Peter responds, and he's possibly a bit perplexed. Well, we know that he was perplexed. Um, troubled by what he'd heard about a betrayer, but him being quite zealous as well. So he says in John 13, 37, he said, but Lord, why can I not follow you now? I'll lay down my life for your sake. And he certainly didn't understand about Jesus' um, death and resurrection at that time. But in verse 38, Jesus goes on to predict that the rooster wouldn't crow until Peter had denied him three times. In Matthew's account... Uh, chapter 26, 31, we're told that Jesus was quoting from the prophet Zechariah, and he said that all the disciples would be made to stumble that night, i.e. they would all be scattered once he, the shepherd, had been struck. So at verse 35, Peter answered, and he said to Jesus, but even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Now again, Jesus predicted that before the rooster crowed that night, which would be somewhere between 12 and 3 a.m., he predicted that Peter would deny him three times. Peter was insistent, however, and he went on to say at verse 35, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And it's interesting to note 
that all the disciples said likewise. In Mark's account at uh, chapter 14, 31, we're told that when Peter said this, he spoke more vehemently. When he made that declaration, he was more vehement about it. And apparently that's from a Latin word. Vehemently comes from a Latin word that means impetuous or even violent. Peter wasn't giving much thought to what he was doing or what he was saying, but he was animated, he was eager, he was forceful, he was passionate, and he was strong. Qualities that I'm sure God would want to use. When predicting Peter's denial in Luke's gospel, we're also told it's revealed that there's another influence at work. Chapter 22, verse 31 says, um, tells us that Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Now, sifting is the final operation in the process of cleaning grain before it's stored. When, also to note, is that when um, Jesus is saying you, he's actually referring to all the, all the disciples, not just Simon. And the third thing to note is that Jesus calls him by name. He calls him by his old name. He says Simon, and that's not his new name, Peter. And I'll come back to those things as we go on. But in chapter 22, verse 33, still Peter says, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. So while there were things that clearly Peter didn't understand, and you have to even sometimes think, was he even listening? He was zealous for the Lord. He wanted to be with him immediately. He wanted to follow him. But despite a prophecy from some 500 years earlier, as well as the Messiah, who they'd been looking for, the Son of God, who was assuring him of what was going to happen, Peter was emphatic, and as I said, he made a number of bold statements to the effect that he wasn't like the others. You know, even if they did it, well, I would never deny you. He distanced himself. He thought he was ready to go to prison for him, and even to death, if it became necessary. So now moving on a few hours. It's the same night, probably about midnight, And the disciples are in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus is sorrowful and deeply distressed. And the first thing that we see is that Peter is unable to follow the Lord's command. He's unable to do what Jesus has asked him. At Matthew 26, 26, verses 36 to 46, Jesus commanded the disciples to watch and pray. He said to them, stay awake. And that was so that they would be able to combat temptation because they were about to be tested. But three times Jesus returned and found them sleeping. Jesus said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And then as Jesus is arrested, while the other disciples are thinking about it, Simon Peter draws his sword. He cuts off the right ear of the high priest's servant. Jesus swiftly heals Malchus and explains that this isn't the way of the kingdom. Brute strength isn't the way that it goes. But the scriptures have to be fulfilled. And next... All the disciples, including, Jesus, including Peter, forsake Jesus. They forsook him and fled. So they've all scattered. So much for being ready to go to prison for him at the point of his arrest. He's not even there. He's gone. He wasn't able to support him in his time of need. And that's all a contrast to the early days when the fishermen, when they were called, they forsook all. They left their nets. They forsook all. And they followed him. There's been a, a real shift. Things have changed. And as Jesus is transferred to the high priest's house for questioning, Luke twenty two fifty four tells us that Peter followed at a distance. It was only a few hours earlier he wanted to follow the Lord immediately. He wanted to go with him wherever he wanted, but now he's at a distance. Yes, he's still following, but there's a gap, a dangerously widening gap between them. Once in the courtyard with the arresting officers, the enemy camp, Peter takes the opportunity to warm himself by the fire. He tried to fit in. He tried to look normal. But his accent and his look gave him away. He was identified by different people, questioned three times. And across the Gospels, we're told that in denying Jesus, he pleaded ignorance. He hadn't been with Jesus. He didn't know him, and he wasn't even a disciple. And on the second occasion of denying him, he uses an oath. The third time, he begins to curse and swear. By now, in his desperation, he's lost it, as we would say. And then, of course, the rooster crowed. So sadly, we see that Peter's actions prove that his words didn't carry much weight. He may have had good intentions, and he may have been emphatic, 
but he wasn't able to follow through. He could talk the talk, but he couldn't walk the walk. And so he began his journey of rapid spiritual decline. He wasn't praying when he should have been. He was operating according to his own strength, his own agenda. He wasn't doing God's will. His priorities had changed. He wasn't following the Lord as closely as he used to. He was fellowshipping with the wrong crowd, was trying to fit in. And then he acted unrighteously. He denied Jesus, his Lord, his friend, his saviour, his teacher, his rabbi. He lied. He bore false witness three times. Scripture says, let every word be established by the mouth of two or three witnesses. There was no going back. He'd done it. And I have to wonder, do we identify with that? Can we identify with that? How are we doing in our walk? Are we walking the walk or are we just talking the talk? Is it time for us to have a spiritual health check? I wonder too that, you know, Peter wept bitterly. We're talking about a grown man, a big man, a strong man, a burly fisherman. He wept bitterly. He was embarrassed, guilty. He'd let Jesus down and he'd let himself down as well. And he knew that Jesus was aware of what he did because the scripture tells us that he looked at him. He had been found wanting. He'd been unfaithful and disloyal. And that had been their last exchange before Jesus died. So at that point, Peter, as I say, he didn't understand about the resurrection. There was nothing he could do about it apart from grieve. They were unreconciled. Thinking about the passage of the restoration, there are two points, two particular aspects that I want to kind of bring out of that. And the first is that Peter had very little to do with his restoration. But having said that, what he did do was quite significant. So this second part of my message is headed, Peter's offering. Psalm 51, verse 17, says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. And this means that a heart, it's about a heart that's been broken down with sorrow for sin, a heart that is humbly and thoroughly penitent. And it's the kind of offering that is acceptable to God. Because God's not into superficiality. He wants it to be meaningful. He wants it to be, fit, to be real. And we can see that Peter had a contrite heart. Because in Mark 14, 72, we're told that after the rooster crowed, Peter called to mind the words that Jesus said to him, i.e. where Jesus predicted that he would deny him three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. He engaged his mind. He engaged his brain. There's a direct connection. That's why he's crying. He didn't just move on. He didn't just breeze past it. And we know that as well, as well as acknowledging and confessing sin, repentance requires us to to change our minds, to make a conscious decision. So as I've said, we know that Peter, he wept. He was a big man, as I said. I mean, he was a man for a start, and I'll leave that there. But he was was a big, burly, kind of big, big, strong man. And we're told that he didn't just weep, but he wept bitterly. Now, the Amplified Version says that he broke down. He wept aloud. He lamented. It was a passionate expression of grief. And let's not forget that, you know, he's gone outside. He's not in a private space. He's in the courtyard of the high priest's house. Or there in a region thereof. It's Passover. There are lots of people about. Jesus has just been arrested. The Sanhedrin are there. There's a court. There's lots of people around. And so whilst we're not expressly told that there were witnesses, you can imagine that somebody must have heard. You've got this big guy out there crying loudly, passionately. But Peter didn't care. His sorrow was uppermost. And it's possible too that Peter remembered some of the things that Jesus had taught about what he'd done, i.e. denying him. Matthew 10, 33 says, But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So every act of our lives will be evaluated at the judgment seat of Christ. And as believers, to not speak up for Christ because of intimidation or persecution will result in a loss of reward. And Jess has spoken about crushing. We might find ourselves in that place, but we still need to speak up for the Lord. But it will result, if we don't do that, it will result in a loss of reward and a consequent loss of glory in the future kingdom. And while I don't for a moment think that Peter was thinking about the future kingdom, I'm sure he was thinking about his failure. As believers, we still need to be alert and we need to be awake. 
Now, bearing in mind also that this, um, in the sermon series, we're looking at all the disciples, we're looking about the journey of the early church, I have felt very much that I need to contrast Peter's situation with that of Judas. Because Jesus gave him a prediction too. And we know that their stories ended quite differently. In Mark 14, 21, Jesus said, The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. And that statement points to the awful judgment that awaited Judas. He was wholly responsible for his actions, even though it had been predicted, even though it was he, what he did was part of the plan for Jesus. He was still responsible for his, act, for his actions. Now, one definition of betrayal is to act treacherously towards one's country by helping an enemy. And obviously, by betraying Jesus, Judas was acting against the kingdom of heaven. And betrayal does include, it covers unfaithfulness and disloyalty, as was the case in uh, Peter's denial. But the difference between the two is that there was is premeditation. Peter was, didn't premeditate what he was going to do, whereas uh, Judas did. For Peter, it just happened, as they might say. But Judas was also unrepentant. Matthew 27, 3 tells us that once he saw that Jesus had been condemned, then he was remorseful, and he tried to give back the 30 pieces of silver whilst also telling the chief, chief priests and the elders, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. And on the face of it, that might sound that it's not too bad. But Judas was only sorry because he realized that Jesus had been condemned. He realized that his plan for Jesus, his plan to force Jesus to act and confront the enemies had failed. If he had confronted them, then as far as Judas thought, and many of the disciples and other people probably thought, the kingdom would come in. But that wasn't the God's timing. That wasn't God's plan. And Judas may also have told the chief priests and the elders that he had sinned by betraying innocent blood, but he really needed to be talking to God. He didn't need to be trying to cover up what he'd done by kind of giving the money back and making it all seem as if it didn't happen. In the end, he went out and he hanged himself. He committed suicide. He took matters into his own hands. He clearly didn't know how to handle his guilt. He didn't know that there was forgiveness with God. 1 John 1 verse 9 tells us that if we confess our sins, then he is faithful, God is faithful and just, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we know from Romans 8 1 that there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And we can say hallelujah to that. As part of Peter's offering, he also brought an obedient heart. And if we look back at Peter's um, life, his time with Jesus, we're not told that he was particularly disobedient. And we know that when Jesus met him, Jesus told him to cast his net on the other side. And that was after they told all night, caught nothing, they were cleaning their nets. They were kind of like, oh, you know, don't really want to. But he has faith and he does what Jesus asked. He, or he certainly did at that time. He showed faith. But then considering what happened... Peter could have stayed away from Jesus. He could have said, do you know what? I'm not going to go because I don't really feel too good about it. I feel really bad and he might not like me anymore. But he does obediently go to Galilee as directed by Jesus because Jesus had said more than once before he died and also after um, that the disciples were to meet him there. Mark 16, 7, the man at the tomb says, go, tell the disciples and Peter that he's going before you into Galilee there you will see him as he said to you. And of course, by, having, by hearing that, by getting that special request, Peter would have known, he would have had an indication that Christ still accepted him. But even so, he could still have chosen not to go. We're told that the meeting in John 21 is the third occasion on which Jesus appeared to his disciples. But there's also another point when the, the two disciples come back from on the road to Emmaus. Then they're told that Jesus has also appeared to Peter. We're not told anything more about that meeting. We're not told if there was any conversation or what was said. But So this would have been Peter's fourth time of meeting Jesus, so maybe that made it easier for him to go to him and feel accepted. But still, he went. And when he went, we're told that he plunged into the water, so he rushed to see Jesus. So he brought an obedient heart. But Peter's heart was also committed, and it was committed in a way that, that it hadn't been before. And I will come to that a bit later. So in the restoration, or to the restoration, Peter brings an offering. And it's an offering that's both acceptable and significant. So even though it's, he didn't have to do very much, it's a very significant offering that he brings. He brought a heart that was contrite. He brought a heart that was obedient. And he brought a heart that was committed. 
And I said that there were two parts, two key aspects that I wanted to focus on. And the second one is this. And that the restoration is it's that the restoration had everything to do with the risen Lord, the fingerprint and character of God being all over it. And this is the practical demonstration of my previous message, as I've said. And so this third and final part is headed amazing grace. And so just to remind us of the character of God and what he says about himself, I'm going to have a look at Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. And this is where the Lord is um, appearing to Moses. And the Lord says, he passed by him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So Jesus sets the scene, John 21. They've had breakfast, and it's actually, Jesus starts the conversation with Peter. And he does that after they've eaten breakfast, and it's a breakfast that Jesus has prepared. It's a breakfast that Jesus has cooked. So Peter's basic needs have been met. His belly's full, and he was comfortable and in a good mood. And they'd had a great catch of fish, and that had also been orchestrated by Jesus. He'd also had fellowship with his old buddies, the other disciples. And it's interesting that Galilee is the place where Jesus chose to complete the restoration because it's a place that they were familiar with. It's a place that they went to, they were at all the time. And it's the place, also the place where Jesus had first commissioned them. It's where he first commissioned Peter when he called them to be a fisher or fishers. He called them to be fishers of men. And at the restoration, after breakfast, Jesus also calls Peter by name. He says, Simon, Barjona. Now, bearing in mind that Jesus had previously changed his name from Simon to Peter, here he is now calling him Simon, son of Jonah. Throughout the Gospels also, he's called Simon Peter, but now it's Simon, son of Jonah. And there are only two other occasions on which Simon, son, Simon, son of Jonah is used, and it's Jesus who uses that name each time. The first time is in John 1.42, when Jesus first met Peter and he changed his name. And the second time is Matthew 16, 17, which is after Peter confessed that Christ, that Jesus was the Christ. So each of those occasions were significant occasions, and clearly this occasion is a significant one too. And all will be revealed on that. But God knows us personally. He knows our name. He knows our roots, and he knows where we've come from. He also knows where we're going. He knows everything about us. Jesus also, in this restoration, Jesus also raises the the issue of Peter's unfaithfulness um, indirectly. He does it very subtly. He doesn't expressly talk about what happened. He doesn't talk about what went wrong. And just like with the woman who was caught in adultery, or just like her, he doesn't accuse Peter or point the finger. But neither does he let the situation pass without acknowledging it. I think he said to her, where are your accusers? And they weren't there. And he said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So he did address it, but he didn't make a big deal of it. And in this case, he simply asked Peter three questions about where he stands now. He's not focusing on the past. He's focusing on the future. And yes, there were three questions, just as there were three occasions and when he returned and found them sleeping, and there were three denials, of course. Now, regarding those questions or the questions that Jesus asked, there's a lot of significance that is lost in the translation because in English there's just one word for love. But in this passage, there are two Greek words that are used. One is agapo, agape, and it means a love of commitment. It's a love of the will. It's where there's intention. It's intentional love. And the other word is phileo, which means a love of friendship, a love of warmth, where there's fondness but strong emotion. And on the first two times that Jesus asked Peter if he loves him. He's asking if he's made a commitment to do so. Has, has he made, is he d- intentional in what he's doing? The third time Jesus asked him the question, he asked him if he loves him as a friend. Each of the three occasions on which Peter answers, he says that he loves Jesus as a friend. There's strong emotion there. Now, Jesus had taught his disciples 
that a friend who loves will lay down his life for a friend. And he needed to know that Peter would be prepared to do that. He needed to know that Peter would be faithful. In verse 17, Peter was grieved because Jesus asked him a third time. So again, he didn't understand something. He didn't understand that Jesus was trying to to evoke, to to get a commitment from him. But Jesus was also trying to assure the other disciples that he'd forgiven him and that everything was okay between them. And in the process, Jesus demonstrated his complete forgiveness of Peter and he restored him to a position of leadership in his ongoing ministry of the gospel. And it was especially important that he did that before he left the earth because he was about to ascend to the Father. He was going away, so he needed Peter to be restored before he went. Peter had important work to do. And whereas Jesus had originally commissioned him to be a fisherman, a fisher of men, he now recommissioned him to feed his lambs, to tend his sheep, and to feed his sheep. So essentially, he was asking him now, he was commissioning him to be a shepherd, take on the role of a shepherd. And we know that he wrote... Um, epistles that tell us that he did just that when Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ Jesus said to him you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it Peter was to be a rock he was to be a pillar and in a significant leading role in the church that was about to be born and in Revelation 21 14 I think it speaks about um, the the walls of the new city and the walls are, have foundation stones, and it's the names of the apostles that appear there. So it's a significant role that Peter had for now, but it would be significant in the coming kingdom. And having restored and recommiss- recommissioned him, Jesus goes on to speak about Peter's death, which must have seemed quite strange to Peter, because he's just been told about his future ministry. But at the same time, you can see why Jesus needed to know that he would be committed, because Peter was going to be bound as a condemned criminal and be totally under the control of Roman executioners who would take him to his death. And it's been historically reported that he was crucified upside down because he didn't want to be crucified the same way. He didn't want to die the same way as his Lord. He was being respectful in that. The last thing we see in this discourse, or here, is that Jesus says to him, follow me. He called him to deny himself and to take up his cross, to make personal sacrifices and be prepared to die when necessary. He was called to bear burdens that would come and to rejoice in his suffering. He was calling him to walk as he walked, as a humble servant. He was calling him to be led by the Spirit, to be submissive to Jesus' conduct. He was calling him to follow him fully, as God had said that Caleb had followed him. He was calling him to follow him in truth, doing the work and duty of a disciple, with all perseverance to the end. He wasn't calling him to just make a good start. It's the same calling that he makes to us, follow me. So in the restoration, as I said, it had everything to do with the Lord. He set it up. He knew that Peter would be there. He had faith in him. When he told him that he was um, going to be sifted, he was going to be tested, he'd also said in Luke 22, 31, but I've prayed for you that your faith shall not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. As I say, sifting is the final process, the final process that grain goes through. So this was a final process, a final sifting that, that Peter had to go through in order to be ready for what God had next. Jesus had prayed for him. He's praying for us now too. So throughout, we see God's character. We see that he was merciful. He didn't give Peter what he deserved. He didn't give him punishment or penalty. We see that he was gracious to him, that he gave him what he didn't deserve. He gave him unmerited favor. He served him at breakfast. He made him comfortable. He restored him tenderly and lovingly to a significant leadership role. He suffered long with him. He didn't get angry. He didn't condemn him or rebuke him. And as I said, the look that night, do we suppose that he looked at him and thought, well, did you, have you seen what you're doing? I'm here dying, about to die for you, and you're down there denying me. You know, I don't suppose it was that kind of look. The kind of look that he gave him, I'm sure, was a look of compassion, a look of understanding, a look of grace. We see that God is abundant in his goodness and truth to him. He didn't forsake him. He got Peter back on track. He looked to the future. And he forgave him. He forgave him freely despite what he did. He didn't bear a grudge. And Jesus has given us all an example to follow. 
He's given us an example of the way that he addresses matters without making a big deal about it. And he brings the, the fallen one back into the fold and enables them to go forward and that they can then go forward with more compassion, with more love, with more understanding. So as I've said, while it was all about him, Peter had very little, albeit a very, signif- a very significant, very little to do with his restoration. But it had everything to do with the risen Lord, the character and fingerprint of God being all over it. God had a plan and Jesus was on a mission. He was working out his father's purpose. And like an arrow, Peter was pulled back and he was pulled back so that he could go further forward and he could go further forward stronger. It wasn't about God fulfilling Peter's agenda, but it was about Peter serving the Lord and doing things his way. Peter needed to stop living and looking at the temporal things, looking at things at an earthly level. He needed to start thinking about things, focusing and get a spiritual perspective. And it's the same for us. You know, we may not all be leaders, but God will reveal what he has for each one of us in due time. But we need to be ready. We need to take a a regular spiritual health check and make sure that we don't fall. But at the same time, we can be comforted knowing that God is faithful And that he will forgive us if we return to him with a contrite heart and in true repentance. God loves us. We can always go to him. We're a work in process. But he said, follow me. His last words to him were follow me. And he's calling us to follow him. He has called us. He is calling us. Are we following? 